Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Joost Blom, uh, Professor Emeritus of Law and uh, Principal this year of the UBC Emeritus College. And um, I want to welcome you to this uh, event uh, about the Campus Vision 2050. Um, to start, I would like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I would also like to note that uh, you in the audience are joining us today, uh, probably from many places, uh, both uh, near and far from the campus. And uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Um, this event is being recorded for archival purposes, you should know, and it will be posted on the um, website of the college and uh, a, we will send a link to you uh, after it has been posted. Um, I, my task today is really just to kick things off and um, to welcome uh, to uh, our event, uh, the uh, three members of the UBC campus and community planning. Um, uh, first off, Jerry McGew, who is the uh, director of planning and design and also holds the title of university architect. Uh, Joanne Proft, who is the associate director of community planning, uh, again at UBC campus and community planning, and Madeline Zemar is the manager of engagement there. And so uh, I would just not, to, I'd like to take no further time myself and turn things over to Jerry. Thank you so much, Yos, for the, uh, the introduction. And thank you all for uh, uh, inviting us in today to your meeting where we'll share some things and really look forward to your, your feedback. Um, there's a number of uh, familiar faces here. Um, we work quite, a, quite, quite closely and regularly with the President's Advisory on Campus Enhancement. And so it's great to see uh, familiar faces and some new faces as well. Uh, so every 10 years, uh, municipal jurisdictions will uh, update their long-term plans on this. And so we're at that time uh, for UBC um, where our plan is, is 10 years old, um, but we think this is a chance to do a once in a generation sort of long-term vision for the campus and really think, think big and comprehensive, particularly given the, all the disruption uh, that's occurred from, from COVID, reconciliation, Black Lives Matter, number of changes on this, and then the environment, the climate crisis as well. So it's a really critical time to be thinking deep in this. And so, um, so we're, we've been taking quite a bit of time to just prepare the table for a planning process. And so we're going in June with a terms of reference to launch the actual generations of plan ideas and uh, short list campus vision, um, uh, for the UBC's Point Grey campus on this. Um, so we've been, we've been in discussions with groups like PACE, with Musqueam and many others over the last year to figure out what are all the needs and aspirations and then to take those needs and aspirations to move them into some principles and strategies which uh, Joanne is going to uh, walk through here in more detail. Um, so it's a really good chance for you to, to see this draft and then to comment and to help shape them. And so uh, look forward to hearing um, all your input. Uh, Joanne? Thanks, Jerry. And, and thanks everyone for having us. Um, do you see my slides? Just say yay or nay. <laughs> no. No? Okay. Going to time to mute. Oh, okay. Okay. How about now? Perfect. Great. Okay. So um, we start with acknowledging that the Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the um, traditional ancestral unceded territory of Musqueam. And as a land use planning process, um, this is a really transformational opportunity to 
deepen our relationship with Musqueam um, and to um, sort of contribute to ongoing work um, that we have been undertaking with Musqueam. And I just wanted to mention a few things around that. The first is a, a, a new relationship agreement with Musqueam um, that UBC is engaging on. Um, and that will articulate how we work with Musqueam across a number of fronts uh, within the university. Um, and one of them is land use planning. And so through this new uh, relationship agreement, it will, we're co-developing uh, a land use engagement process that's going to sort of identify how we engage um, in a more uh, deep way with Musqueam on campus vision, but also on all our land use planning processes going forward. Uh, and and this, is, this is very different than when we did the previous land use planning process. And so we're on this journey um, of uh, supporting the Indigenous Strategic Plan and, uh, and reconciliation. Um, and it's also uh, going in parallel with working with Musqueam on site specific projects across the university where we're uh, working on deepening uh, Musqueam presence in, in these projects and capital projects and in the landscape. And this image shows um, the Musqueam uh, house pole in, in the U Boulevard um, uh, public realm. Uh, and, and so we're, we're really taking this as um, uh, you know, sort of a, a new direction in, in how uh, the campus is, uh, is expressed and how we uh, plan the campus going forward. So campus vision is a comprehensive land use planning and public engagement process, and it's going to shape how the Vancouver campus changes and grows over the next 30 years. It, um, its key outputs at the end of approximately two and a half year process will be a 30 year vision, which will take us the next year to, to, to do. And I'll say more about that later on. Um, and that 30 year vision, it will be very aspirational. It'll cover all sorts of aspects um, uh, as to how the physical campus looks and feels. Um, and that will be translated into an updated land use plan. And the land use plan is really the, the highest regulatory policy for land use on the campus. And we report to the province on that. So following uh, the completion of the, the vision and the land use plan update, which is gonna take about a year, we'll then move into a more specific 10 year campus plan. That's gonna be really an implementation of that 30 year vision over the next 10 years. The types of things that the campus vision uh, process will include focusing on the physical uh, uh, layout of the campus um, and how you know the land uses work with transportation work with um, ecology and sustainability what types of development and density ranges make sense for the campus over the next 30 years um, and in combination with identifying those uh, possible development and, and density ranges, uh, we know it's really important to also look at what areas of the campus um, will be preserved and, and um, you know, sort of uh, preservation of, of, of natural and open spaces we've heard is a, is a really important aspect of, of, of maintaining what's so special about, about the campus. Uh, we'll be looking at what types of services, amenities, and open spaces are needed to support the future campus population. And we'll also be working very closely with our regional partners um, to ensure that this plan is nested within a broader context and a broader appreciation of where UBC sits within the region. Why are we doing a campus vision now? Um, so some things you know, why we plan. Uh, certainly the, um, the last campus plan was done over 10 years ago. Um, and the, those plans really shaped how the campus looks and feels today. A lot of the transformations um, that we, uh, you know, for instance, in this photo, uh, were really part of that, that last uh, campus plan and land use plan. Um, and they, um, the, the, those plans, uh, you know, they were put in place um, to anticipate future change, and we actually grew uh, faster than those plans anticipated. So it's it's really time to update uh, the plans to anticipate um, future change um, and also catch up <laughs> to uh, 
to, to the kind of growth, growth that occurred over, over the past decade. Within the region, as we know, there's a lot of pressure related to affordability um, and how the campus is connected to the region. Um, and at the same time, forces around climate change and reconciliation and coming out of the pandemic, understanding how different patterns of work and learning and teaching and hybrid uh, 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 spaces um, uh, might change the, 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 you know, how we organize and plan the campus of the future. Um, and finally, we need to continue to support UBC's land endowment. Uh, UBC has a, a very unique relationship with its land in terms of how we finance university needs and priorities through development of our neighborhoods and market housing uh, to support the academic mission, um, which, which um, contributes funding towards student housing, faculty staff housing, uh, as well as uh, scholarships and, and other um, uh, programs across the academy. Our engagement approach is comprehensive and, and, and broadened from our original engagement principles to really center on equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, responding to the multiple interests of the UBC community and Musqueam. Um, so that includes faculty, staff, students, alumni, residents, um, and, um, and of course, uh, Musqueam, um, the, uh, the relationship agreement that I spoke of earlier. Um, this sort of roadshow that we're doing is, is, is part of a, a toolkit of, of formats um, that, that we're um, engaging with the community on to really reach deep into the community to understand what, uh, what those aspirations are, what the needs are and interests are that we need to consider over, over the next 30 years. And then, as I mentioned, engagement um, with the province who governs uh, the land use plan and the province um, in engaging with the province on, on other files, including rapid transit, um, including the academic uh, mission side of things, uh, in addition to um, uh, approving a land use plan. So this is a, a timeline, a high level timeline. Um, we're in the green part, the needs and aspirations. So we're just heading towards um, a final terms of reference that we'll be presenting to the Board of Governors in June. Um, and this is a revision of the preliminary terms of reference that was presented uh, in December. And what this final terms of reference will, will do is really set the goalposts for the project. And so coming out of um, the, the, the engagement period that we're um, just ending right now, we've developed some draft principles and strategies. Uh, and uh, those will really set the, the tone and um, the sort of um, uh, the, the, the goalposts um, and the foundation for how we then uh, develop options for the 30 year vision. Um, and then, you know, every sort of, we'll be coming back to the community at, at, at various points of the process um, to um, review those options, discuss options, and then and, uh, develop a final 30 year vision um, sometime about uh, spring 2023 that will then be translated into, into that land use plan update that I mentioned. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Yeah, I mean, I think right now we're just, we're really in, in sort of the foundation uh, phase. We're early in the process. And so we really want to get it right. Um, uh, and that'll be captured in this final terms of reference that, that we're going forward with in, in about the next month. So I'm going to... Um, turn it over to Madeline, who will talk about some of the highlights of our current engagement or where we're at right now. Thanks, Joanne. So as Joanne mentioned, throughout the two and a half year process, we'll have points where we're engaging the public to get their input and their feedback. And um, we launched the public engagement in January and we had a month long period where we were really looking to understand and explore the university community's needs and aspirations for the future of the campus. So we engaged with faculty, staff, students, residents, as well as alumni. And we gathered input using an online platform that we have um, 
as well as we had numerous public events, including open houses, in-depth workshops, facilitated community conversations, and various pop-up groups, or pop-up booths, as well as joining groups across campus, like your group now. Um, and we sought insights at that phase into the community members' experience of the campus currently, so what works well, and then thinking also about the hopes and dreams for the future. And we also wanted feedback on a set of needs and aspirations that Joanne mentioned um, that we categorized into eight different themes. And so um, Joanne, if you could go to the next slide, this slide shows the eight themes that we presented to the community. And we were really seeking input into the opportunities and challenges related to these themes and whether they captured the, the community's needs and aspirations for the future campus. So the eight themes are highly interconnected. Many of them are mutually reinforcing for example, better transit, uh, supports affordable housing, as well as climate action. And some of these themes are really in tension with each other, like more development, reducing open space. Um, but this was the initially what we presented to the community. And I won't go into depth into each of the themes, but we do on our website have a lot more details about how we came to those themes. Um, but when we presented those themes to the community, um, there were, eight core challenges and opportunities that came out of that process. And um, I'll just highlight a few of them. So addressing the affordability crisis was major theme that we heard. So we heard that life on campus is unaffordable for many and getting worse, um, and that UBC should, should think about building more affordable housing. We heard a lot about accessibility and safety of the campus, as well as meeting the needs of diverse community members. Um, and a strong call for more amenities and services across campus. Um, next slide. We also heard about um, like strong in interest from across the community about um, honoring and celebrating Musqueam and working with them to include their indigenous ways of knowing in our planning process. And there was a lot about UBC's mission as well, the academic mission, a strong desire for our team to emphasize UBC as a university and place of learning above all else. And then the climate emergency about that, um, as well as managing growth to accommodate the preservation of green space and biodiversity. So from all of that um, engagement we did on these themes, we, in, um, as Joanne mentioned, it informed where we are now, which is we created a set of draft guiding principles and strategies. Um, for the planning process. And we presented those, or we're presenting them now to the community to get feedback. So that's what we're hoping to talk to you about later today. And, the, and uh, I'll turn it Sorry. over to Joanne to walk through them. Yeah, and these are the two, these are the two questions that, um, that we hope to discuss with you later and what we're seeking feedback on from the community. So do these, as you're listening to Joanne, as she talks through the principles and strategies, um, just keep these questions in mind. So do these principles and strategies reflect what you think is important for the future of the campus? And is there anything you'd like to add or change about the principles and strategies? Back to Joanne. Thanks, Madeline. Um, so just a little bit on what we're striving for in a principle. Um, we wanted to capture what we were hearing in those challenges and opportunities that Madeline mentioned. We wanted the uh, principles and strategies to be specific to UBC, not just generic, um, that they're really uh, intended to guide uh, planning action uh, for the land use plan. Uh, we also want them to be digestible, accessible, uh, using plain language. Um, and we want them to be bold. We want them to be inspiring uh, and aspiring for, for this 30-year uh, vision. So the first is uh, supporting UBC's pursuit of excellence in research, teaching, and learning. This is really about the academic mission. And so this is about making sure that we're providing uh, the appropriate capacity to meet um, you know, teaching, learning, uh, and, and future research uh, needs um, also, um, making sure that um, the, the plan is, is flexible to future change and, and evolving needs. Um, we also uh, you know, want to make sure the campus is used as a test bed and a, you know, a place for research. So we have this term campus as a living lab. We want to really um, um, uh, strengthen that through this process. 
The second is deepen UBC's relationship with Musqueam and advance the indigenous strategic plan. So just building on the relationship agreement and making sure that we're carrying that through all aspects of our, our land use planning and into how you know, the campus has a stronger um, Musqueam presence and spaces that are welcoming and inclusive of all indigenous people. The third is supporting affordability and everyday needs of the campus community to the affordability crisis and really trying to confront affordability and how we how we plan the campus in terms of providing housing, uh, supporting the housing action plan, uh, which is under review right now through where uh, housing is provided, the, the amount of housing uh, for the UBC community type and tenure and cost, and making sure that uh, housing provision is also combined with um, uh, the um, uh, provision of daily needs uh, to support the population in close proximity to, to that population. The fourth is foster inclusion, belonging, and community building. And so, you know, what we heard from um, from our engagement is is that a lot of people feel left behind. Um, and so, this principle is is really about making sure that as we plan the campus for the future, it is inclusive. Uh, it builds community and, and belonging uh, for the diverse community. The next is steward the land to enhance the campus ecology and livability and fund UBC's priorities. So this is a, a meaty one. <laughs> this is about um, you know, the, the, the land endowment, our, our relationship to the land as it relates to um, uh, you know, providing for a livable, uh, campus environment, uh, making sure that it, 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 it enhances the ecology and, and what makes UBC special, but also uh, provides funding sources for UBC's priorities, including a potential contribution to rapid transit. The next is, I'm just wondering if someone, oh, sorry. Um, uh, the next is lead in responding to the climate emergency. So this one is really about supporting the climate action plan um, through various measures that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And this is where rapid transit comes in, reducing reliance on uh, single occupancy vehicles, um, reducing water consumption, um, uh, making sure our landscapes are low maintenance, um, they're climate adaptive and resilient. Um, and then finally, strengthen connectivity within the campus and to the broader region. So making the campus itself more connected, making it easier, more convenient and more sustainable to get around um, and more accessible to get around on campus, but also making sure that we're connected to the broader region. And this is where planning for SkyTrain comes in. It's where we have to make sure we're coordinating with academic planning at UBC sites across the region, including uh, for instance, Surrey, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Um, and also just making sure we're doing good planning and coordinating um, with, with our neighbors, uh, the UEL and uh, the city of Vancouver. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about, um, a little bit more about uh, the endowment here and just how we, um, you know, how we're looking at supporting future needs through how we use our land. Um, and, and what this process is gonna look at is um, our neighborhood development. Um, uh, our current land use plan has an allocation of neighborhood development associated with it. And that's about 13.7 million square feet of neighborhood development. Um, and, and this slide just shows what that neighborhood development contributes funding for. And so it contributes funding towards providing housing options um, for UBC faculty, students and staff, it contributes to academic excellence um, through the um, uh, uh, through you know as I mentioned uh, providing um, funding for student housing, uh, funding for scholarships and, and and faculty positions, academic programs, and so forth, as well as providing funding for amenities and infrastructure. And so this process is going to look at additional. Um, residential development beyond what's in the current land use plan of 13.7 million to further fund these um, priorities, but also a fourth priority, which is realizing UBC's commitment um, to explore financial contribution to extending SkyTrain to campus. Um, and so this, this circle here is supposed to be animated and it's supposed to show a fourth um, 
prong on the on the right that is is contributing to rapid transit, but really um, it's an important piece of this this puzzle that we're trying to um, embark on is is how to um, create a sustainable livable community um, while also um, financially supporting uh, the university priorities which which are listed here. And so how we're going to do that is um, identifying, being very clear about where those potential development areas are going to be. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the land use plan does identify future neighborhood areas. We're gonna be looking at those. We're also gonna be looking at potentially increasing development on undeveloped residential areas like uh, Westbrook Place, there's, there's some, some remaining sites that we'll be looking at and is there potential to increase the development there? Um, and we'll also be looking at um, making some adjustments to the existing neighborhood boundaries. And so potentially making them, them larger so it can accommodate um, that additional growth. We'll also, as I mentioned, be identifying areas of no growth um, to make sure that there, you know, we're, we are preserving those, those areas that are special, uh, including UBC, UBC Farm, the Botanical Gardens, uh, Rhododendron Wood, and, you know, those, those areas of green academic that are really critical um, to land-based research at, at the university. Um, I'm not sure, most of you probably know about Stadium Neighborhood. Uh, the plan is, is still in draft form. It's, it's, um, it, it, it wasn't approved at the time a couple of years ago, and uh, we were directed to consider um, how that future neighborhood stadium neighborhood really fits within this broader campus vision. So that will be resolved within the options that we develop for the campus. And the options that we'll be developing for the campus will be guided and tested against the guiding principles that we're presenting here today, as well as looking at these three sort of lenses of urban structure and ecology, character and livability and financial support to, to make sure that we're sort of considering all of these sort of legs or, or, or sort of um, interlocking spheres of, 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 the, of the needs. Um, and then we'll also be looking at how the vision is phased over 30 years. So it's not all gonna happen at once, um, but really doing it in a measured way that makes sense um, and that's sustainable. So next steps, um, our engagement on the principles and strategies ends um, today. Is it today or tomorrow? <laughs> um, it ends today, but we're keeping the survey open for a few more days. Okay, great. Yep. Um, and um, we've, we've held a couple of open houses, but really um, we, uh, really encourage you to fill out the survey. And also we wanna have this discussion um, following this about your feedback. And then following this, we'll be refining the principles and strategies, um, being clear about what our growth assumptions are as inputs into this final draft terms of reference, final terms of reference that we're presenting to the board in June. And just ending with the timeline again, and I will stop there. And Welcome, questions and discussion. So I think we can open it up for questions if anyone has questions about the process, but we also wanted to get your feedback. So if you wanna, if anyone wants to put a note in the chat or raise your hand and, um, and then I can call on people in the order they've raised their hand and we're happy to take any questions or comments or feedback. Um, and the feedback, like I said earlier that we're seeking right now is really around those guiding principles and strategies. So curious if they reflect your vision for the future of the campus, um, but any other sort of comments or feedback, I'll be taking notes um, so we can make sure to include all of your, your insights. So I'll open it up. Oh, we have Perhaps. a yeah. 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 Peter Ward, uh, Emeritus in History. Um, I, this is very, very interesting. This is my first engagement with the process, so I'm, I'm very much a newbie. Uh, it's all very intriguing, uh, but I have a kind of, well, it's not exactly a skeptical question, but this is a process about growth, uh, a discussion about growth and its complexities and its uh, benefits. 
uh, there doesn't seem to be much in the discussion about limits to growth. And of course, there are limits that are physical and there are limits that are social and financial as well. I'm just wondering if, if you have anything to say about limits to growth that you see emerging from this set of discussions. Thank you, Francis. Jerry, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, or, well, I, I think I'm sorry. the, you know, the process that we want to go through in the planning process is to taking the various needs that the community has or aspirations that they have and seeing how we, we most successfully meet as many of them and achieve a good balance. And so the limit to gr growth will come just by very nature. We're hearing a strong call for the strength, for increasing the, 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 um, the biodiversity and the integrity of the biodiversity on the campus as well. We're hearing strong uh, feedback about creating a, a really livable um, community and that includes um, good access to a variety of green spaces on this. And so it's, it's I think it doesn't show up as a, uh, as a, um, you know, a defined limit, but it's when you bring these interests together, the X, the, you know, the, um, the goal is to, how do we be smart about it and uh, achieve the multiple interests as best possible? There, there will be trade-offs um, and the board will need to hear from the community on the community's thoughts on those and the board will need to make decisions on those. But we're, we're trying to see is um, that uh, to use those limitation things uh, in a very thoughtful way. Joanne, I, I, I th thank you for the comment. Uh, I, I don't want to sound in any way skeptical here, but uh, in my observation, uh, not just at UBC, since I've been associated with the place for almost 50 years, uh, but in general, it seems to me that uh, uh, development almost always wins <laughs> and in these kinds of encounters, uh, basically because uh, the, the undeveloped, the, the vacant, uh, the, the, na the natural part, of the world uh, doesn't really have interests uh, that it can articulate very well, then people to speak up for it. Uh, mm -hmm. The latest incident we have is the, the contest between uh, Cary College, which is a religious college, and uh, trees. <laughs> and um, uh, I don't know how this is going to turn out. I've got uh, my own suspicions, but it seems to me that that's a kind of uh, uh, miniature uh, kind of clarify some of the basic issues uh, that should be part of the planning process because uh, trying to find ways of, of making the natural world um, uh, uh, give it a, a voice at the table is, 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 is an important one. Mm -hmm. uh, fully agree. I, we actually just gave a presentation to the a number of uh, academics that are in biodiversity and um, eco services. And so it's called the seabirds and sea cubs groups on this. And so we just came out of that and they were looking for the principles to be stronger um, in, in promoting uh, biodiversity and protection of uh, assets on campus already. And so uh, they it, it's a really good comment that we've heard out is that the bio, you know, the, the critters and plants don't have a voice how, how do we make sure in this process that uh, they are they gain and don't lose in this in this process? So uh, very good comments. Thank you. I'm concerned about you know the cliff and marine drive. If you go to Break Beach right now, you will see that you know there is a lot of erosion going on, and some of it is due to the construction of high rise building on campus. And uh, it goes through the different layers of sand and clay. And now uh, on the, the beach, you can see that the sand can be kind of stable, but underneath you have the layers of clay and the water is dripping down like, you know, a small cascade. So I think Marine Drive will have to be rerouted through lower mall, you know, fairly soon and the heavy traffic in you know, all those trucks, they should not use uh, Marine Drive, but you know, go off you know, east and uh, west or north and south so that you don't keep you know, eroding the cliff. 
That's that's an excellent uh, comment is to look at our activities on the campus and how they affect the downstream um, surrounding area, the park, the, the cliffs, the uh, ecology of the area on that. Um, and you've, uh, it's great you have a, a clear knowledge of the areas that we do just for other people's benefit. UBC where it sits, there's two layers of clay between uh, the elevation of the main campus and sea level and water runs down, hits that clay lever and then runs out to the, to the cliff and does cause e erosion if, if we have too much of a surge on that. And so there's been a lot of uh, thinking ab about um, rainwater management um, and with climate change, there is forecasted to be increased rainfall events, uh, no longer one in 100, but up to one in 1000 sort of uh, level. So that is something that's um, clearly from the planning is, is making sure there is uh, ample rainwater detention facilities on this. Uh, there, we're also working with um, Metro because we're also with sea level rise, it's causing the um, erosion of the tow of the cliff as well. And so there's, there's, there needs to be thinking on this. And, you know, I think Francis behind your comment is also the, you know, concern about just development on campus and, uh, and uh, avoiding impact from uh, unnecessary development. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Looks like we have Christina. Francis, was your question answered? Should we move on to Christina? Hi, um, I work at the Emeritus College. I've been working on campus for, I think about 12 years now, previously in ceremonies. And I mention it because it becomes part of my question. Um, I hear the word community used a lot and I don't see anything specific about how to go ahead and build community. I mean, this is all about facilities. And so to, two things that I want to mention. One is about housing. And I'm wondering if uh, co-housing has come up in some of the, especially within the affordable housing options. And um, the other is, you know, when I worked in ceremonies, we had a hard time getting people to stay on campus. There's a lot of uh, venues and opportunities for entertainment, lots of talented people but you can't get people to stay on campus if there's nowhere for them to eat. So they finish work um if you want them to stay for a concert what is there but more fast food and you know if you don't create a kind of you know a city kind of atmosphere and a place for them to want to congregate um the the, the whole place is just gonna go dead at five o'clock or four o'clock so i'm wondering if that's been thought of and then in terms of housing uh co-housing um, is, a, is a form of intentional housing. And I'm wondering, so far in Canada, it's always been a question of, it's always been structured as strata owned because it's a, that which is a very expensive option, but it's the only option open because of um, zoning restrictions and so forth. Um, but I think on the UBC campus, there's probably a possibility for non-market options, whether it's within the co-housing model or not. And I'm wondering if, uh, non-market housing has been explored at all. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Jerry, do you want to take the housing and I can take the community uh, or you can you can do both? <laughs> okay, well, well what I um, uh, start in and you can you can add in there. So uh, just say that um, Christine, that the notion of building community is is um, you know, absolutely critical. It's something we heard strong and something that they've, we've heard back seems to me perhaps even stronger in the principles in there. Uh, and it's from the perspective of if you really want to attract and retain talent on the campus, community building is, is one of the best ways. And then it also helps with just the well being of the community on it. So it, it's a really critical need and aspiration uh, there. And it's also tricky as to how. Um, when you do physical planning, how do you build community? So I, I, I like your, your line of inquiry on those. So just um, going that. So we are, we are curious and really welcome any strategies of how to build community on this. On the housing front, um, UBC has developed co-housing um, 
Uh, it did one project for faculty and staff in South Campus on this. Um, in parallel to, with this uh, planning, the, the uh, visioning process, there is a the five year update to the housing action plan. And part of that is looking at those issues of how do you, what are the, the types of housing that are being provided on this? Um, and so in, including uh, ownership models for, for um, uh, as well. Currently our policy is to provide 30% of the housing on campus is to be uh, dedicated to university housing. 20% of, of the total is to be affordable housing. So 25% um, below market rental on this. Um, so that housing action plan is really gonna look at through discussions with uh, the community on how to provide better access, better uh, varieties and types of housing and the affordability question of uh, targeted affordability for those in need. Um, there's also a question which we did through our stadium neighborhood, which Joanne mentioned, is a shift from, is that proportion right of 30% uh, rental for, is that the right or should we be increasing that? Because the community quite emphasized that rental actually builds, at least on the Vancouver camps, it seems to build really strong community on this. And so there's some really good questions. Um, and they're gonna be explored quite in depth through this housing action plan. But let me uh, turn it over to Joanne for additional comments. Sure, yeah, um, I, I, I appreciated your, your comments around the, um, the sort of cultural precinct and, and how, you know, strengthening what we have here. Cause I mean, we have so much to offer in terms of attractions uh, but yet there is, you know, what, what we were out on a walking tour with our, our consultants in the in the northern part of campus around, you know, Chan and at the theater and, you know, the music building and yeah, like there's just nowhere to 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 go after, you know, a show or something and, and, and so that that was an idea like how, how do you make people stay and and really, um, you know, sort of make the area more vibrant. Um, and so that that's definitely um, a, a great idea and something, you know, that, that we're going to be looking at is, is how to strengthen our, our existing assets. And, and, you know, at the same time, you know, thinking about, okay, in order to support those amenities, you actually need people living here too. Right. And so it's, it's, it's that, 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 that symbiotic relationship between a population, a critical mass and being able to afford uh, better amenities, right? And so how do we do that in a way that, that, that does um, respect and protect those things that make UBC special, um, but that also creates a vibrant um, campus? Thank you. Paul, did you have a question or comment? Yes, thank you. Um, th thank you, three, for the, the presentation, the opportunity to, to hear more about this plan um, and the variety of ways online you've had for uh, people to give input. I'm, I'm surprised at how little input there's been online, but um, I want to go back to Peter Ward's question about growth. And, and I think that it's been a, a, an unanswered question for years at, at UBC is how big should we be? Um, there are always pressures to grow. Uh, parents want their kids to be able to go to UBC. Um, if you ask faculty members, they'd all like their, their area of scholarship to grow, bring in more colleagues. Unless the university actually <clears throat> tells you folks in this planning process, what are the limits to growth? Then I agree with Peter that you know, development's going to win. And we're going to lose in terms of the other important aspects of, of the campus, the, 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 the physical place, the space, the um, biodiversity. And <clears throat> yes, we'd like more people to live on campus. There's, there's a current unmet need, I guess, amongst faculty, staff, and students for living on campus. I would say that should be the limit to what growth should be. Um, and I would urge you to go you know, back to the administration and say, what are you thinking in terms of growth over this next period? 
because unless that question's answered, I'm, I'm concerned that the campus is going to be further just built up and it's not going to achieve the other goals. But thanks again for, for this opportunity. Thank you for the comments, Paul. Uh, Jerry, I was just going to speak a little bit about the academic infrastructure plan process a little bit, and then maybe um, you can chime in. So um, you're absolutely right that we need direction from the academy or the, the university on, you know, what type of university um, are we going to be in the future? And, and there is a process actually underway through the provost's office to create what's called an academic infrastructure plan. Uh, it's something that we don't currently have. We have a strategic plan um, that, that lays out, you know, sort of across the university writ large, um, broad strategies um, for, for, for the university. Um, it was created maybe five, five years ago. Um, but there isn't anything specific to, you know, growth and, and, and sort of specific needs of, of, of the academy as it relates to um, space and, and teaching and learning and curriculum. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's, um, it's uh, fortuitous that, that this academic infrastructure plan is happening uh, in lockstep with campus vision. And so that process uh, being run, as I mentioned, by Maura Quayle out of, out of the provost's office is gonna be engaging deans uh, and students and faculty um, and administrators uh, in really articulating, um, you know, the types of, of learning, uh, teaching and research um, uh, opportunities uh, that we want to um, um, seize <laughs> and, um, and, and, and tie those to, okay, what does that mean for, for growth um, over, over the next 10 to 30 years? Um, and it, you know, it relates to international enrollment. It relates to um, faculty hiring. Um, also, it relates to how we, re uh, we interface with other campuses across the region, um, you know, Surrey, uh, Great Northern Way, and, and, and Robson Square. And so it's, it's trying to be, um, you know, uh, strategic. Um, and, and yes, identify, okay, what, what does the future of the campus look like? What does the future of the academy look like? Um, and then in terms of, um, uh, and, and I would also just say that signs are pointing to, you know, enrollment is, is likely to, to, to slow down uh, compared to where we've seen it uh, over the past. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, um, there, there have been some, some times in the past that have been more accelerated. And so we're probably looking at a, a, a leveling off of, of, of enrollment for, for, for the time being. Um, in terms of um, housing and development, um, your idea of, you know, we should be prioritizing the housing needs of, of the UBC community. And I think we would absolutely agree with that. And that's, that's echoed in the principles. Um, in order to fund those, However, there is this sort of relationship between how we use our land. And so that's the kind of delicate balance. If we, if we want to provide more housing for students, faculty and staff to fund that, we also need to at the same time be um, creating development opportunities uh, um, through, through market development. So it's, it's, it's sort of finding that balance. Jerry, anything to add? Well, I, I uh... Appreciate Christina's um, graphic there. That I, I think we um, oh a good time for us to listen to uh, the, the group here. Thank you, Paul. Well, well, good summary of oh sorry the, the challenges. No, all's good. Um, let's Thank let's you. hear uh, a few colleagues. J Judith, so I hope you can hear me. I, I'm I'm worried about my Wi-Fi connection. First of all, I want to th thank you for such a nice, nice presentation, Nation. Um, I actually live on campus, and so I'm very aware of how much effort you've made to contact us, us, and I thank you for that. But I'm really struck 
by the difference between maintenance of UNA and maintenance of campus. So someplace in the whole development, the need for maintenance is, is real. Secondly, I, I just cannot believe the density in Westbrook. And I think it's, it's a bit concerning about how dense and what kinds of things are happening there. And I realize it's not part of your mandate, but it is part of the universities. And so I'm worried about that. And last but not least is the taking care of the foreign student and that some kind of proper orientation and taking care of them is really needed. Thank you. And did you have a question? And no. Yep. You're asking me? Correct. I know right. Graham. I know Graham does. So maybe we can move to Graham and then if um if Anne I'm Pitter not and I think she was speaking, yeah. Sorry, Graham. Okay, Anne, thank you. you. Okay, I'm am I going? Yes, go ahead. Okay, yep. thanks. And, I, I'm really uh, want to echo here the concerns that Peter Ward and Paul Harrison uh, have raised. Uh, and before I get to that, I just would say that I'm heartened to hear about Maura Quayle's committee. But I'll begin by saying that climate activists have a slogan, which is that there's no planet B. And in thinking about campus development, it seems to me that we really should be thinking about a plan B. Uh, we're talking here about 2050, and I think that it's quite feasible that the University of British Columbia and universities more generally will be very different places by 2050 than those we now know. But as with most planning, uh, it seems to me there's a kind of path dependency in the process. Even if we recognize that growth in student numbers is likely to slow over the next while, we're still assuming that students will come to the campus, uh, that the business will be pretty much as usual. And I think there are all sorts of signs, uh, part of them created by the pandemic and the switch to online learning, uh, some of them created by student demands across the country that they prefer the convenience of online learning to being on campus, that if we continue along the path of building student residences, um, assuming that we will have uh, endless thousands of students coming onto the campus to live at some considerable expense, we will be locked into a kind of uh, building inertia that makes the campus uh, dysfunctional. Here's, here's an alternative. I don't say it's going to happen, but if the demand for online learning uh, for students, and there was an ideas program last night which suggested that students are becoming increasingly disillusioned with the university experience and not going to enroll and so on. If the, those plans, those trends continue, uh, here's a possibility that we have two components to the University of British Columbia by 2050. A substantial online credentialing operation where the teaching is delivered remotely and an honors college kind of arrangement with perhaps, uh, I don't know, eight or 10,000 students on the campus itself. And if that does come anything close to realization, uh, all of these grand plans, it seems to me, would need to be uh, really rejigged quite significantly. So, you know, I just, I just do embrace the notion that Maura Quayle's committee and your planning committee really need to think hard about possible alternative futures than the oh so familiar one that we have 
uh, become accustomed to over the last hundred and some years. Thank you. I, I heard part of that program too last night. That was very interesting, thanks. I know that, um, Anne, did you wanna comment? If you could unmute yourself, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Hmm. I have a quick question. Where will the uh, subway terminus be on campus? So the, the planning with TransLink um, and other partners is still underway, but there is a, um, a sort of agreement uh, in principle that the, uh, the location will be in uh, right in U Boulevard, the U Boulevard area. Um, and, you know, it, it, it still has a ways to go in the planning. It still has to sort of be uh, approved as a project and funded and, and everything. But the, 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 the notional, um, the current sort of base case alignment is, is um, the U Boulevard area uh, underground. And they are looking at a potential for a future second station as part of um, the reference case that would then be, you know, sort of developed in more detail, but but that's that's where it's sitting right now. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Can hear me. Uh, I, I in, uh, appreciate what Graham had to say about online learning. Uh, it, uh, I'm wondering, for example, how uh, our development sh should consider um, how how should, how can climate change uh, affect the progress of the university? Uh, we had a speaker on our committee, John Madden, was talking about uh, um, climate change. Um, the our best year for fighting climate change was a couple of years ago when we didn't have anybody on campus. <laughs> I mean, uh, I understand that there was a, a proposal that uh, the university would try to avoid having classes on one day a week so that there wouldn't be a lot of students uh, uh, around and that the climate change score would be uh, improved if there was nobody on campus. I, I just, I'm just interested in this. And also, uh, Graham said about having uh, online learning, to what extent can the university uh, share great online programs that were developed uh, to avoid having a, a lot of uh, people on campus at certain times. Thanks, thanks, and And the climate uh, emergency discussion preceded the campus planning. And so we're, we can really take advantage of that. And the two big initiatives sort of building on what you said, one is how can we reduce our carbon uh, impact of UBC, both in the, the building, the campus, but also in trips, air travel, et cetera, but also adapting to uh, climate change, which is, is the forecast is for drier summers, uh, wetter winters, and some su significant impacts from that. Um, I, think we're, I think we're at the hour. So I, I want to, um, and if you want to have a follow-up uh, with this, but I do want to close by saying that, um, you know, uh, you know, there's a number of, there's some good comments and uh, like Paul's that we'll uh, look to respond to in uh, when we adjust the, the principles. We are hearing, you know, there's from this conversation, you know, we're certainly leaving with this notion, but a strong concern about the, the growth and the implications of that, both on, on green space, the ecology, the, the, um, the climate on this. Um, and that, that will be a, uh, um, something that we're hearing from a number of voices. We're also hearing quite strongly from 
the students and other groups the need for affordable housing, the, the need to provide for these needs. And so it's a, it's a really um, tricky equation. So I really appreciate the insights about how can we be clever? You know, we heard um, this notion about uh, using online as a better tool on this, or, or and so the notion, do we, does everyone have to come out every day to the campus on this? Um, and well, lastly, I, I think what's appreciated from this group is this notion of us working with Mora to say the academic plan, how can it start to adjust its behavior um, so it re it's conscious of its impact on the peninsula, on the on the planet. That's very helpful because we tend to be we we tend to be staff in the face of faculty that um, I think, as Paul says, you know, have their ambitions to continue growing their unit. And so, um, I, I think uh, you've highlighted the 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 challenge that's in front of us. Um, uh, we will, as we go through the process, we will really look forward to your continued engagement. And I, ideally engagement with these other groups as well that who are some of which are saying we need to grow more. So um, we really look forward to um, building on your feedback here as we go forward into the process. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I included some links in the chat here, but I'll also send an email to Mia and she can share with everyone our website, um, my email address as well, if you have any additional comments, concerns, feedback, and then our survey will be open until Friday. So if you wanted to go in and include more of your feedback related to each of the principles and strategies, feel free to do that. We'd love to hear from you and, and hope to come back to this group, um, maybe in September when we're, when we're presenting options for the future of the campus back to the community. So thank you so much. Really appreciate Mia, Yaus, the whole Emeritus College crew for organizing this.